Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth talk of uh, 2022. This is the winter speaking series uh, hosted by the Nepean Sailing Club. Uh, my name is Park Davis. I'm going to be your MC again this evening. Uh, as a recap, uh, there's seven more talks to go. Uh, we're doing a countdown every Wednesday at 7.30 uh, from now until April 6th. Uh, the listing of the talks, as I've said before, are on the NSC website, nsc.ca, and all the talks are going to be recorded. So if you want to see them, um, uh, just search Nepean Sailing Club on YouTube. I also want to uh, welcome uh, new members of NSC uh, tonight. Uh, our membership director apparently has uh, sent out notes to many of the new members uh, to uh, uh, note some of the topics, uh, this being one of the topics that uh, she thought would be of interest to anybody that's recently bought a boat, a sailboat, uh, how to maintain your canvas and how to take care of your sails. So welcome you tonight as well. These talks are free, um, but just like we used to pass around the beer jug and ask uh, for donations uh, when we hold, held these at Nepean Sailing Club. Uh, on, uh, now that we're doing them online, uh, we've now adopted the Eventbrite system. Thanks to all of you that have already donated. Uh, as of last night, uh, we've raised over $900 uh, towards our cause. So please give yourselves a big pat in the back for all you've done so far towards uh, youth sailing and helping to support those uh, people uh, this coming summer. These talks are organized by not three, but four of us now all working together. Uh, Tony Wright is our webmaster and uh, he works to publicize the talks. He's become our Zoom master as well and also our Eventbrite master. So next person, Stephen Kidd, he works with scheduling and finding speakers. Then behind the scenes, uh, working with Tony each Wednesday. And uh, he's also spelled me off uh, as MC and he will be doing that for the next couple of weeks uh, when I'm away. Uh, tonight's presentation. Before we start, uh, again, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens. Uh, uh, you can put your questions there and we'll get to all of them as soon as we're finished with the speaker. Uh, our speaker, Vicki Hogan Gao, is going to tell us about sail maintenance and repair, uh, her most common repairs, the types of things she does most frequently, uh, the factors that can affect sail life and habits uh, to maintain your sails and canvas in top notch condition. If you've had to buy a new sail, you want to pay very close attention because maybe you don't have to buy uh, those sails quite so frequently. A friend introduced Vicky to sailing uh, when she was uh, quite young using a homemade dinghy made of recycled ply plywood uh, with some tattered sails while she was on holidays in a spot called Brigus, Newfoundland in the summer. In her 20s, uh, she moved to Ottawa and she joined the RA Center and she learned to sail and race on Dow's Lake. And much more recently, I guess I can say that now with all her equipment uh, and her abilities to make sail repairs, she's become uh, what I'd like to think of an essential part of the sailing infrastructure in the national capital area. So I want, without anything further, I want to turn things over to uh, Vicki, please. Thank you, Park, much appreciated. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen with everybody before I get started on my presentation. Hopefully this is all gonna work out swimmingly. Uh, all right, so as uh, Park said, I'm gonna uh, speak today about, mostly about uh, sail and canvas care and maintenance. Um, a little bit, uh, we'll have a couple of, we're trying to do a couple of short surveys on the type of repairs and so on that I do. But I think I wanna spend most of the time today um, speaking to you about maintenance and uh, uh, care of your canvas and sails because I, I'm firmly convinced 
um, that you can extend the life of your sales and canvas by twice as much as, as you would if you didn't give them any um, routine care and maintenance. And, and so that's really um, given the cost of uh, things like Dodgers, Bimini's and sales and so on. I think that's really an important um, aspect of keeping, protecting your investment and keeping your, your, um, your sales and canvas in top notch condition. So um, just to say what the agenda will be, I'm gonna do a short photo gallery. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures to start with because I don't wanna be outdone by, by Tony Wright and, and, and uh, others who have brought many lovely pictures of sailing to their presentations for this uh, speaker night. And, and this is a very dry topic sale and canvas maintenance, as you can imagine. So um, I thought I'd start out with a nice photo gallery of pictures and I'm gonna tie that all together and how that relates to um, a sale and canvas repair. And we're gonna do, then we're gonna do two short surveys, which I think Tony is gonna help me with. And then I'm gonna give you my collective thoughts on sale and canvas maintenance and the importance of self-sufficiency um, at sea, which really means being able to help yourself um, when your things go bad with your sales and your canvas. So um, to start with, um, there are many types of sailors and I've got a bunch of interesting pictures here that I pulled off the internet. Um, you might see yourself in one or more of these, um, but lots of different types of sailors, um, racing sailors, cruising sailors, um, and you know, just love to be out on the water and have fun sailors. And there are many different types of sailing boats. And I put, I, th I threw this one up there because I think this, this one most resembles the, uh, a picture of what I learned to sail on um, way back when I was a, a kid in Newfoundland. Uh, so that's, uh, and there's another, you know, great looking picture of who, who knows, somebody's pedaling, somebody's sailing and the, you know, the monkey is uh, the crew. This, I think I've seen many times in our Harbor Master races um, uh, over the years, and I don't know that, what this guy's up to, but um, he's, uh, he's definitely sailing his little vessel. Um, here's some pretty action-oriented uh, pictures of people hanging out on the edge and, you know, heavy, heavy pedal to the metal racing. Um, here's, a, here's a picture I picked up because I, I used to always do foredeck in the racing I did in my career. And I would say that this is the quintessential foredeck guy. This is the guy you wanna, when you're interviewing for foredeck, you want somebody that's willing to go out in the, on the pole like that. And he's probably doing that anyway because he, he was the one that forgot to put the guy um, at the end of the pole. But in any case, looks like there's a fair amount of water out there and, and he's braving it to fix the problem. This is an F-18 and F-18s are a pretty fast non-foiling um, uh, development formula design um, catamaran class. And um, they got started in the early 1980s and um, uh, they have very little, interestingly enough, they have very little rigging on them for sail adjustment um, because the, the, the premise of that particular boat is that, you know, to sail fast, but not, but just to, to focus on the steering and the, um, and, and the, you know, the, the strategy of racing rather than tweaking 10,000 different things on deck. So it's very popular racing fleet in the San Diego and California area, although I don't think we see too many of these boats up here. Um, this is pretty much a typical picture of what you might see out on our own race course in the Ottawa River, people rounding marks and um, <clears throat> things get pretty, pretty uh, congested and sometimes tangled up at marks, but I thought this was a very excellent picture of what to, um, you know, what to expect when you go out there in the race course. This is a boat that probably most people are pretty familiar with. This is the Waterworld boat. Um, from the 1995 movie Waterworld, um, starring Kevin Costner and Dennis Hopper. And uh, this, interestingly enough, um, this boat, which is a um, Orma 60, built in France by Junot uh, and their Lagoon division. Um, and it had, in this movie, there were two different boats. One was the actual boat that raced because it was a, it, there were many scenes where the boat was racing or moving very quickly. And then there was a, 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 a second boat, which was more or less a prop boat. And interestingly enough, um, the, this boat is still um, racing. It's owned by somebody in, uh, it's called Low Re Real, and it's owned by somebody in uh, San Diego. 
And so this is a picture of, uh, of the, the former Waterworld racing boat, the, the real racing boat, um, Trimoran called Low Real Racing in San Diego. And I was just doing some, some updating on the internet of this particular picture and um, apparently boats for sale. So anybody wants a enormous 60 Trimoran, it's, uh, I'm sure it's gonna go for a good price because it's starting to get old. Okay, so here's, a, here's a, another boat that needs no introduction, um, Mass Walk by Alex Thompson. Alex Thompson is the guy who's done five Vindy Globes. And this boat, uh, uh, Hugo Boss, was actually built for um, him to um, uh, take into the, um, or race in the, in the Vindy Globe. And here he is doing a Mass Walk. That, that's, that's actually Alex Thompson, the skipper of that boat, walking on the mast. Um, and he went all the way out to the end and then he came all the way back. So if you want, and all these are on videos on YouTube, if you want to have a look at them, they're quite, quite uh, exciting to watch. So then he decided, well, master, the, the mass walk wasn't enough. He needed to do a keel walk. And you can see him on the, on the red keel there. He's standing there in his Hugo Boss suit. Um, and uh, that was sort of his second stunt. And then that, not to be, not to be outdone, um, because I, I think this guy is like, not only is he an excellent sailor, he's a really crazy, crazy person. Um, so he decided that, that he was going to try to do um, a skywalk. And so here he is with um, Hugo Boss pulling him. And he's just, he's just lifting now off into, uh, into the air on his kite. And uh, like, I'm just, I, I'm in awe on a person like that, 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 that is, is that, um, I don't know, um, able to, uh, you know, uh, Put, play, put that kind of faith in the people that are sailing his boat and actually do these kind of stunts. Anyway, if you're interested in seeing all the, the, the footage of this that are all on, um, on uh, YouTube. And then you might wonder where did uh, Water or sorry, not Waterworld, but uh, um, uh, Hugo Boss end up? Apparently it was bought last year by a 28-year-old Swiss skipper um, who is going to sail it in the 20, uh, 2024 Vendy Globe. So it will make a comeback. Um, uh, Alex uh, Thompson sailed it in um, the 2020 Vendy Globe. Um, and I think, can't remember what he placed in it, but he, he certainly didn't come first. Um, and then he sold the boat. And now this, this gentleman here is going to um, skipper it in the 2024. So we'll hear more about uh, Hugo Boss. Anyway, so that's, uh, oh, and the, la the last couple of pictures, um, these boats need no introduction, America Cup boats, um, uh, Luna, uh, Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli, what a, what, a, what a mouthful that name is. And of course, uh, Emirates Team New Zealand, who won the, uh, uh, the America's Cup, the 36th America's Cup. And the one, that, one of the reasons I wanted to put this in is because I think one of the prettiest boats I've ever, ever seen is uh, um, Luna Rosa per, uh, Prada Pirelli. I just, I think it's just, a, well, trust the Italians to, you know, make a, uh, make a, a mark about how pretty a boat is. And, and I just think this is just an amazing looking boat. Anyway, um, I, was, I was for Prada Pirelli, but of course, of course the defenders uh, from New Zealand um, won the America's Cup. So how do I pull this all together? So that's the, that's the, it, that's the, the, the sort of entertainment and picture side of things. How do I pull it together? Well, there's many different types of boats. And the one thing that they all have and, and share in common is that their performance is ultimately determined by their design the sailing ability of their crew and the care and maintenance that they receive over time. So I think the thing that's most forgotten by a lot of sailors, not necessarily racers um, in particular, but by a lot of sailors in general is the care and maintenance that they give their boats. So that's where I'm gonna focus my, the rest of you know, my talk today is how to care and maintain both your sail. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about the running rigging, but um, um, sorry, the standing rigging, but the, but the maintenance and care of sails and uh, canvas. Okay, so the topics I'm going to cover are the most common sail and canvas repairs that I do. Um, sail and canvas care and maintenance has a, a whole bunch of topics. Um, what to look for when inspecting a sail, what to look for when inspecting your canvas items, factors affecting the life of your sails. And I, I think I'm probably going to spend the most time on those factors because 
that's where you're going to learn a lot about how to how to maintain your sales and then useful care and maintenance items and products which i don't which i i'm not endorsing i'm just telling you that there are there are some very good products out there that that can really help extend the longevity of your both your sales and canvas um, and then um, I'll, I'll end off the presentation with, a, with a, a, a several different um, uh, resources that you can go to, for, um, SailRight being one of them, which is a do-it-yourself, um, self-sufficiency at sea type resource with everything that you need to, you know, make your, everything from make your own sails to build your own sail covers to how to, how, you know, all the, all the equipment. Um, for replacing and repairing sails and canvas, et cetera. And then um, the, they have a, just a whole number, a large number of do it yourself and learn to videos. So I'll give you the website for all of that and invite you to go and have a look at their website. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is, is a couple of short, very short surveys. And um, I just wanna ask the question to see you know, where, where people's knowledge uh, sits. What's the most common, what do you think is the most common type of sale repair that, gets that I get requested to do in the spring of the year? Okay, holes chewed by mice, 39%, rip batten pockets, zipper replacement, UV cover repair. Okay, those who chose holes chewed by mice have the right answer. So here we go. That's the thing that I most get in the spring. And, and, and I must tell you, it's, it's always for me, it's sad to see, um, I've had, at least one or two sales that have come into me with most two holes in it that the previous year when they were before they were put away they were brand new sales um and just heartbreaking to see you know because when a mouse chews through a sale normally they go from the outside in and sales folded or rolled or whatever and so that chew hole will will go throughout the whole sale and you'll have maybe six or six or seven spots where the whole um the holes that have been chewed um uh, are in the body of the sale. And it's always a shame to see that kind of thing happen because it's very preventable. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak a little bit later on about where not to, to, to store your sales for the winter um, to try and avoid this kind of thing from happening. And so we'll do one more short, short survey um, and then I'll get on with the kind of the, the, main, uh, the main attraction of the, uh, the presentation on maintenance and repair. Okay, so the next, is what is the most common type of canvas repair I receive or get asked to do in the fall? Okay, here's our result. Winter covers, oh, I'm surprised that number is so low. Broken zippers, absolutely. UV covers, no. Ripped batten pockets, no. I mean, not that those aren't, on, aren't common repairs, they are. But the things I get asked to do most often in the fall usually have to do with tarps. And, and so broken zippers are, are a big one. And the other is also give yourself a pat in the back if you said winter cover rips. And quite often I, I receive, you know, big tarps that have uh, zippers that have teeth missing holes or, and holes in them or, or one or the other. And I don't receive them until let's say, you know, late October. Um, and then, then it becomes an emergency because, okay, the boats are coming out of the water or they're out of the water already and I need my cover or whatever. Please, 
please inspect your covers when you take them off in the spring and know that that sale repair is not an emergency business. So if you want to get those things repaired, you need to be doing it over the summertime. Okay, because there's, there's not really a lot I can do when you bring it to me and you need it for the next day. And uh, anyway, so those are those are the things I, I mostly get asked to do in the fall. But another a third one, I guess that 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 should be notably mentioned there is um, uh, rips or loose, uh, uh, loose seams and so on in the UV cover of a Genoa. I get that quite a bit in the fall as well. So that uh, that's the survey. Thanks for participating. Just wanted to show broken zippers, and the and and zippers break when you force them. Um, and a lot of people force their zippers, and the reason they have to force them is because they don't ever lubricate them. They don't ever wipe them down so that they're not full of grime and grit and and um, dirt and so on. And then they break the zipper, and it's very costly to to sew in a big zipper. Uh, well, to, first of all, to buy the zipper, but then to, you know, to do the, um, the uh, labor to sew it in. So, uh, and, and one of these number 10, this would be a number 10 zipper, which is a big, one of those big uh, wide zippers that are about an inch and a half in, di uh, in width. That, that, lip, that zipper should last longer than the canvas that it's sewed into, as long as it's not exposed to the UV. So there's no excuse when, when I see these zippers, the, the zippers are next to brand new and they've got teeth missing out of them. Um, that's really just people forcing zippers um, because they, they don't bother to maintain them. So just wanted to like, I mean, I put this up here to, to say that technically speaking, a number 10 zipper, very robust product should outlast the Dacron in, in, in any, or the, sorry, not the Dacron, the Sunbrella, or the canvas, outdoor canvas that it gets sewed into. So um, just saying, if you've got a new Dodger or Bimini or whatever, or a new um, uh, tarp for your boat, it should outlast the tarp. The tarp should rip before the zipper does. So if something, something's happening, something's not being done if I'm seeing ripped and destroyed zippers. Okay, so other common sale repairs that I get asked to do. Um, rips, both small and big and spinnakers. Now I'm going to say the rips and spinnakers. Um, hmm, okay, so if, if, if you're on the race course and somebody, you know, slams into you or whatever and rips your spinnaker, okay, I'm going to give you that one. There's probably not a lot you could have done to prevent that other, especially unless, unless of course, they're on, you're on uh, port and they're on starboard, then that's your fault. But it, it, if, if, if they're hitting you and they're on port, Probably not a lot you could have done about that. All the rest of the spinnaker things are usually preventable, the sp spinnaker rips and so on that I fix. And sometimes um, I'll get like a huge rip. It's a whole panel and, you know, can you can you put this together? And it's really like remaking the spinnaker. And and it was this, the, 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 the problem that, that caused the, the damage, the rip, was that they dragged it underneath the boom um, where there was an exposed cotter pin. And, you know, really, is that preventable? Would everyone say that that's preventable? Yes, that's preventable. Like, that's why they make rigging tape. So um, that's, uh, you know, that, that I get asked to do often. And many of the rips I can tell are, are quite preventable. Then I, ask, I get asked quite a bit to do rips and batten pocket ends. That's, that's somewhat of a legitimate um, uh, uh, damage to a sail, but it usually results from too much um, hard luffing of a sail. And really you shouldn't be letting your sails luff because that's what wears them out fastly. That's what makes them rip. That's what makes the, the stitching um, loose in it and so on. So in some ways, rips and batten pocket ends are preventable. Um, and then rips in the sacrificial UV covers, restitching, holding down. Okay, so that the sacrificial cover gets UV damaged for sure but um, it shouldn't be at the point where it's ripping off before you bring it in to, to sew, you know, to sew it down again. You should try and make sure that you, you're, when you're inspecting your sails, that you, when you see that, 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 that the, um, uh, uh, the stitching is starting to come undone somewhere, you do the stitch in nine, stitch in time, uh, stitch in time saves nine thing and get it fixed sooner before it becomes expensive. Then patching mouse shoe holes, again, I'm going to say that's totally preventable type of uh, damage to a sail. 
Um, and that happens to canvas as well, not just sails. Most, you, most don't care where they go for warmth and nesting. Um, and then replacing broken zippers and mainsails, covers, dodgers, bimini's and, and winter tarps. And I already spoke about that. So it's all very preventable if you, if you just don't force them. And then do, I, bet I get asked to do re-stitching re of sail panel seams. Um, and that's usually just in, in older sails, like older sails that are, I'm gonna say, let's say 20, 20 to 30 years old type thing, um, where the, eventually the, the seams just give way, especially on the, the leech edge of the sail, um, because the, the UV is so old and it's just been sailed in the, UV, uh, sorry, the, the, the Dacron is so old and it's just been sailed for so long um, in the UV that it, it starts to deteriorate. And then I get asked to patch holes and rips in mainsail covers. Okay, that, that's again, another aging thing. Um, but I'm gonna give, show you some products that will help you maintain um, uh, the uh, water repellency of your ca uh, canvas products and also will um, stop the UV from eating through the or wearing out the material over time. And if you use those couple of products, you can, as I said at the beginning of the talk, you can extend your canvas um, by, by easily twice as long as if you don't do anything at all to, to maintain it. And then I do a lot of cha um, uh, putting on um, uh, tape on the foot uh, of the sail, especially near the tack, because the sail is dragging on the across the deck every time you you tack back and forth. Again, that that chafing is preventable by just making sure that you hoist it high enough on your um, your uh, uh, for for stay that it's not dragging all the time on the deck. Uh, I get asked to replace broken leech lines, jam cleats, and usually leech lines break because they're being again they're being reefed on and forced. Um, jam cleats break. Um, because they get UV damaged over time, et cetera. So some of that's legitimate, but breaking leech lines, I mean, I, I really like, usually they're, they're, they're fairly sturdy lines. So I really wonder how much pulling um, is being done when a, when a leech line gets broken. And then I patch rips and sails made by dragging the sail across the spreader with no boot. I already made, uh, made a comment about that's what, um, that's what they sell rigging tape for. And you should be buying rigging tape in the spring of the year, and you should be not only putting it over over top of your spreader boots, but always at least have spreader boots, if if not rigging tape over the spreader boots. You should be um, putting rigging tape on all of the um, clevis pins and anything that that has it is potentially sharp. Anything that's on the the um, the lifelines or the stanchion posts or so on that could snag on the sail and rip it needs to be covered with uh, rigging tape. Um, and then chafing a bolt rope covers on luff and foot. And that again is another preventable um, um, uh, damage to sails. And it usually is created by having some sort of burrs happening either in your, your, your mainsail track or the track along your boom that your that your foot foot uh, of your sail goes into, and so when I when I see the chafing on bolt ropes and it's 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 a very hard repair to do because you don't have a lot of play in terms of putting a big thick piece of dacron over it or it's not going to go through your your uh, your um, uh, uh, tracks anymore. So it's a difficult repair to do. And when, when I look at it and see that, you know, th that there's ripping in a certain area, I can pretty much tell that there's a, there's a burr where that particular um, part of the um, bolt rope is sitting. And, you know, so I say to the, the people that bring me sales with that problem, you need to check your, you know, your, um, uh, you need to make sure that you, you, you take a, um, what do you call them? I'm just trying to think of the, the things that you use to, to yeah, to a file, a file, to file down the, the rough areas within the tracks and so on, so that it's not gonna destroy, destroy your sail. Because once you, once you um, have repaired one little section, you cannot put another uh, repair over top of it because you won't be able to, um, the sail won't be able to move in the track. There's only so much play and so on. So another preventable um, um, uh, repair for sails. 
So those are the common things that I that I do from you know from one year to the next. And as I said, most damage to sales and canvas is preventable. Um, all sales and canvas wear um, with use, that, that, part, that part is for sure, but you can extend their life significantly by understanding the factors that affect the life of your sales, which I'm gonna talk about as soon as we're through this slide. So the factors that affect, affect your li the life of your sales are, are what you should really, if you don't take any other message home today, that's what you should really pay attention to. And then observing a few common sense sale and canvas care practices on a routine basis. And that's sort of like the last part of the talk that I'll, that I'll get to. Okay, so factors affecting the life of your sales, routine inspection and early attention to areas needing repairs. And I think I already mentioned that, that you know, sitch in time saves nine. So don't wait until the UV cover is flying, flapping around in the wind um, and it's just ripping itself off to bring it in. Like you should have brought it in probably the summer before when it was just starting to, uh, for the seams or the, the stitching to unravel. Um, the quality of the dacra on the sails uh, uh, and the, the, the sail cloth that's used to make the sail, that matters as well. Exposure to UV radiation, that's a huge factor um, impacting the, the longevity of sails. And then the wind conditions in which the sail is flown, heavy versus light winds. Um, not adhering to the wind rating of your sails, and I'm, I'm always surprised to hear that I'll find out that a lot of sailors don't even know that sails have wind ratings, so that, that tells you a lot. Um, luffing sails hard in heavy winds, uh, sail folding and rolling methods used, use of rigging tape on sharp areas of the rigging, I've already talked about that, dirt and mildew on your sails, and storage of sails off season. So those, these are all things that, that have a pretty, pretty big impact on the overall longevity of your sales and, and canvas as well. This applies to canvas as well. Okay, so routine inspection and early attention uh, to worn damage areas. I, I can't stress this enough. Um, and it, if you don't inspect, you're not gonna see where you've got, you know, things starting to happen or seam starting to come undone, UV damage starting to erode the, you know, the um, integrity of the fabric and so on. So if you don't, if you don't look, you'll won't see. Okay. And I think a lot of people don't look because a lot of the stuff I get for repair, it's just like, uh, one wonders how it got so bad without, you know, without anybody even noticing until, you know, until finally the sale won't, they can't sail the sale. And so bring it in to, to see if it can be fixed. So early inspection and early attention is, is huge. Um, said this already, get repairs done before they become expensive because of course, the more work involved in a repair, the more expensive it is. And a thorough inspection of your sales, all of your sales should, and your canvas and your canvas as well, should be performed on, on uh, a yearly basis, at least once a year, Twi twice if you're really vigilant, but at least once a year. And, and normally I would say the best time to do that is in the fall of the year. And if you ever are, uh, spring of the year though, I've, I've seen um, sales that are unrolled and, you know, and, and on the floor up in the East room from time to time and thought, oh my gosh, look at that. The, the owner of that, that's, that sale is inspecting the sale. But when I, then I found out later, no, they were measuring it for per, but they weren't inspecting it. They weren't looking, <laughs> they weren't looking for any, you know, any damage to the sale or whatever. But so we've got our East room up there and we've got, you know, we've got nice grassy spaces within the club where you can go and roll your sails out and you can have, you know, you can have a good look to see, you know, if there's anything that needs attention. Okay, what to look for when you're inspecting your sails, you inspect the head, the clue, the tack and so on for signs of wear. You look for rips or tears in the body of the sail. I mean, tears are gonna be fairly, uh, fairly obvious even when you're sailing, but sometimes very small rips start small. And then when they get into a big blow, you get into a big blow, rips turn, small rips can turn into big rips very quickly. Um, you inspect the UV cover to ensure it's solidly sewn down along the entire leaf's edge, because when it starts to, when you luff your sail and so on, and, and, and the UV cover is not firmly um, anchored down with all the stitching because the stitching is starting to come undone and so on. Um, you, that, that, that's when you start to get big rips in your UV covers. 
Um, you should inspect your batten pockets, especially the ends. Again, that's a, that's a, um, a fallout of hard luffing when you start to see rips at the end of your um, batten pockets. Um, look for UV damage, uh, damage stitching in the panels, seams, UV cover, leech soil, really like you're lo looking for stitching, which the UV, UV starts to erode in the sail. And that's when things start to rip or seams start to come undone or the UV cover starts to come off. It's all because the, the stitching that was, was very solid when the sail was first made is now UV damaged. And that is what starts the sort of the, the, the decline of your sail and canvas. And then you look for areas of chafing and abrasion on the tack, the clue, the head, the foot, the bolt, rope, and left tape. So if you if you walk around your sail and you take a good look at it from like from all those particular angles, you will see if it needs attention anywhere. And again, it's always your, it's always in your best interest to protect your investment and to get anything that looks like it needs attention taken care of, look, looked at early earlier rather than later. Um, when inspecting canvas, it's more or less the same routine. Look for rips and tears in the canvas, look for UV damage stitch in, in the stitching. Um, and that happens a lot in things like biminis and so on, which are all day long um, uh, being UV irradiated, right? Not just when you're sailing, but all day long when your boat sits in the harbor and so on. So, I mean, there's nothing you can do about, about the UV damaging your stitching. But what you can do is when you notice that the, the stitching is starting to unravel is to get it restitched um, before you start to see rips forming in the, um, in the canvas. And then look for areas of chafing and abrasion. Um, that happens, hmm, that happens um, on, on, on biminis and so on when you've got your backstay going through the bimini um, and that so sometimes ends up um, always you know, like eroding the, the canvas and so on. So, I mean, it's, a, you know, you, you, put, you put them up and you take them down. So you're, you're, you're looking at these items twice a year at least. So that's when, you know, you should be looking closely at, okay, do I see anything that needs attention here? And then these zippers, inspect all zippers to ensure they're solidly installed and have no missing teeth. And hopefully if you buy, if you buy, like if anyone has ever bought a new Bimini and a new Dodger, you know how much money they cost, you know how expensive they are. And when you get them in pristine condition, when you first install them, 10 years later, they, they should be just as good as the day you bought them if you do all the things that I'm going to get to in just a minute to, to maintain their, uh, the integrity of the fabric and the integrity of the zippers and so on. So when I see you know, a, a canvas item that is, the, the canvas is in pretty good shape, but the zipper's all you know, ripped out or the teeth are missing or whatever, that tells me that just somebody is just forcing, forcing um, the zipper um, and not even bothering to take any time to put it, any lubricant on it to help uh, to give it a fighting chance type thing. So zippers, zippers are expensive to, to um, well, they can't be repaired, they have to be replaced. So the, they're expensive repairs. And, and they're preventable for the most part. Okay, quality of the Dacron and the sails. Not gonna spend too much time on this, but only to say that, that most cruising sails are, are, are made of Dacron, uh, performance sails being made more of my, um, Mylar Kevlar or laminated sail cloths. Heavier Dacron, um, the stronger the wind rating on the sail. Um, not all Dacrons are created equal. Like you got just plain ordinary Dacron. Dacron versus polycarbonate, Dacron versus Spectre, and Spectre is a Dacron that has um, uh, striations of, um, uh, I'm trying to think now what, Stri striations of, uh, well, spe Spectre is, is a line itself that, that makes it extremely strong. Um, and not, I don't see too many Spectre sales out there because it's just so expensive, but usually plain Dacron and maybe polycoat Dacron. But the more expensive your Dacron, the more expensive your sale, um, and uh, the, the more effort you need to put into maintaining it to protect that investment. And then not all sale makers are created equal either. And I had a quote once when I was down visiting um, KSL in Kingston, 
where one of the owners, uh, Andy Sofer, said to me, only the left and the foot are constant in a sale design. The rest is the of the sale is the sale, sale maker's business. And that's why you'll see in, in class racing or whatever, where you've got, you know, um, sales that have to be of, of a certain size and, you know, uh, dimension and so on. But you'll see they have different, different, uh, you know, different luff lines, different place, uh, different types of um, luff cleat, or not luff cleats, um, uh, cleats for um, the, um, uh, the lines in the leech and the, and the foot. You'll see different um, head boards um, on the mains and so on. So you see different pieces used to make them. The only thing that, that is the same in a class sale is, is the size, I guess, and the camber will be different. It, it just depends on how the sale maker makes that particular sale. So the quality in your sales um, is, is definitely a factor um, to consider when uh, you want to buy a sale. And the more you pay for your sale, the more you should spend your time and effort to protect it. Okay, exposure to UV radiation. This is a huge factor affecting sale performance or sale um, longevity over time. UV is definitely not your friend. Your friend, and and I'm always amazed at the number of people I find who really don't know how how um, what how much of an impact UV has on a Dacron sale. Um, I've had people just you know they they decided to get a roller furling. Um, and so they just, uh, okay, they, they, they decided that they were going to get a, get a sale that, that uh, they could put a, a luff tape on, um, and, they, and they put that up on their, um, their force day, and they just wrap the sale around it, uh, and they don't bother to, to have a UV cover installed because that was going to be expensive. Not and, then, and then a summer later, they're coming to me, and, and the whole leech, leech uh, edge of their sale and foot are trashed because um, the UV just ate it away and, and UV will eat a sale away within a year. It, it's that, it's got that much of an impact um, on, on the, it just degrades the sale cloth to the point where there's nothing you can do, it just disintegrates. So um, you really need to do whatever possible, whatever possible you can to protect your sales against UV irradiation. Now, obviously when you're out sailing, the sun is shining. I mean, that's why that's, you know, when we all like to be out there, but okay. So you can't do anything about protecting your sail when it's up sailing. I'm talking about when, it, when your boat's in the Harbor, um, you know, when you're, when your boat's sitting on shore or whatever, that's when you have to make the effort to try and protect the, um, the sails and the canvas from, from UV um, irradiation and eventual damage. <clears throat> So you should never leave a, uh, or store a sail directly in the sunlight. I've gotten a lot of dinghy sails over time, um, which are it's kind of heartbreaking to see because the, the body of the sail, uh, the background is in very good condition, but the, the edges are completely eaten away, as I say, because they've rolled it up, um, you know, either around the boom or around the forest day. And um, the, the UV, wherever the UV hits is where it degrades the sail. And I've also seen, yeah, of people with no sacrificial covers because they didn't want to get them installed, too expensive. Um, where three years later, they, and, you know, brand new sale is now um, garbage, basically. Um, and you can't once you once this UV has destroyed the dacron, there's really nothing you can do about that. That the sale is done at that point. And so all furling sails must have a, a sacrificial UV cover installed. Although interestingly enough, the sail makers don't, they don't put that, they don't put that as part of the cost in, normally um, in, making, in making you a furling sail. They'll expect you to um, ask for it and then they'll want to charge you extra for it. And so when people make the decision not to spend that extra money, they pay the price for that. Um, and then ultimately the best, best way to protect your sail when it sits um, furled on your force day is using a UV sock. Um, it's an extra step and you have to have an extra halyard. You have to have like a spinnaker halyard or whatever so you can pull it up when you're, because your sail is already on, your sail's uh, furled around the force day and it's already um, on its, uh, uh, the Genoa halyard. So you need a, 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 a spinnaker halyard or a second halyard 
um, and you have to go and pull it all up and put your put your sock on at the end of the day when you're putting the boat away. So it's an extra piece of an extra step, an extra bit of work, but it's 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 totally worth the effort in terms of protecting your sail. Okay, so wind conditions um, never leave a sail. Um, uh, never exceed the um, uh, wind weighting of a sail. And the wind rating of your sail is normally found in the, and it'll be on the clue or the tack, probably more, more so at the tack. Um, and it'll, it'll be a, a number that's written by the sail maker. Could be, you know, 12 to 14 knots, could be, you know, uh, six to five to, to, to 15 knots, whatever but there'll usually be a wind rating written on your sail, especially a racing sail, maybe, maybe not so much an old cruising sail, but definitely a racing sail. And you should never exceed um, that's, that uh, sail, that wind rating. Um, because if you do, you're risking, well, you're more than risky. You're going to stretch the Dacron or the material in your sail. Um, and um, that's going to degrade your performance over time. Um, when, and so, as I said, when sails lose their shape, their performance diminishes. And then rather than push your sails hard in heavy winds, which I see a lot of people doing on the Ottawa River, you should consider the following because you have options. You don't have to, just because the wind piped up on you and you weren't expecting it. Okay, I, I appreciate that if you've got a roller furling sail, you're not gonna send your foredeck person up, your, your wife or whatever to ch change the head sail. I get that part, but you, as a furling sail, you can always reduce it. So shortening sail is always an option. Taking the head sail down and sailing on just your main, that's another option. Changing down to a smaller sail, if, if, if it's not a furling sail, if it's a hanged on sail, change the sail. Um, putting up an older sail um, that you don't care about whether it's, uh, it's gonna get stretched because it's already stretched or damaged. Um, and then gee, the final, the final thing that you can give consideration if it's really blowing stink is why don't you motor anchor or head back to Harbor? But s s being out, uh, in a heavy, heavy blow, when you've got sails that are not rated to be out there, you're just asking to rip them, to stretch them, and to uh, and to damage them. So, just saying that you got there's a there's a whole list of laundry list of options for you, um, rather than just sit there and um, push your sails to the max. Uh, so you need to play. This is a this is one of the factors that you really need to pay close attention to. Um, Otherwise, you, it, it, you're going to end up um, diminishing the life of your sale and definitely diminishing its performance as well. Okay, luffing sails and heavy wind. There's another thing. Um, I see boats out all the time out on the Ottawa River where people are, it's, it's heavy, heavy winds and the, the sails are luffing like to the point where if somebody walked up on deck, they could really get hurt luffing that hard. Um, that's a that's a sure way to to um, diminish the life of your sails is to keep luffing them in heavy heavy winds. So um, uh, you're going to wear them out faster, um, and it's it's always better that you just keep them full of wind. So you know I can appreciate that there are you know sometimes when you know you've got to you're in the middle of a tack or something and you got to stop midway and the sail starts to luff or whatever. But if you're just luffing it and, and for no good reason, um, really you need to, to try not to do that because the, the luffing of sails is, is really hard on, um, on the sail, sail canvas or sail material that's made up. Um, and, and as I always say, be kind, take your sails down in very heavy winds to, present, to, to prevent excessive wear and tear on them, okay? Because at the end of the day, um, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not racing, um, you know, the America's Cup out on the Ottawa River. Um, if you have to, you got a motor in your boat and, and there's a motor there for a reason. If it's not conducive to, you know, um, sailing and you're gonna break equipment and so on, take the sails down and, you know, motor into the harbor. <laughs> 